Thanks for watching the Meridian Friends Church sermons here on YouTube. You can also listen to a podcast version of the sermons on either Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts if you ever need to listen on the go. For more information about our church, you can head over to www.meridianfriends.org or check us out on Facebook by searching Meridian Friends. Thanks for tuning in and enjoy the sermon. Fear not. Can anyone say amen to that? (laughs) Did you know? (laughs) We can watch it again. It's so good. (laughs) Did you know? Fear not is the second most repeated command in all the scripture. If you're curious, the first most repeated command in all scripture is praise the Lord, which is a wonderful remedy for fear. Fear not. We're commanded over and over and over in the scripture. Earlier in the service, we invited you to identify an irrational fear. Now I want to invite you in the privacy of your sermon notes so that nobody else can see, I'm sure. If you're brave enough, write down somewhere a rational, that you would consider a rational fear. Something that you know is weighing heavy on your heart, weighing heavy on your life, If you're not sure what your rational fear is, ask this. What do I think about the most with regard to a what-if question? What if our minds are just so wired somehow to ask that question incessantly over and over and over? What if? What if this happens? What if this doesn't happen? Then what? I want to invite us to turn to Exodus, the book of Exodus. And I'm beginning a series this morning, actually, I introduced it last week, from this wonderful, hopeful, amazing book. The book of Exodus is a picture of God's ability to rescue his people. And what you may not know about Exodus is that actually it all begins with fear. Exodus chapter 1, as we open the pages of Scripture to that, we notice that fear is what triggers everything else. It is, in fact, the whole reason that God's people are found in bondage. Keep an eye on this theme as we think more about Exodus in the coming weeks because it's a theme that surfaces over and over and over through this book. That's helpful to me. to be able to identify, to know that God is totally aware of the fact that we are just naturally fearful people, and to know that he has a remedy for our fears also. I wanna invite you to stand with me as you're able. We have, I understand, 10 people present in the fellowship hall, so welcome fellowship hall friends. Um, I just saw the online number is up from past weeks, and I'm thankful that you're joining us online. And I have to say, It's so good to see people to preach at, I mean, to share the good news with today. (laughs) I am glad that you are here as well. I'm reading from Exodus chapter 1. These are the names of the sons of Israel who went to Egypt with Jacob, each with his family, Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah, Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin, Dan and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. Are those random names? No, this is the story of what's happening in the Old Testament. God promised through Abraham that he's going to be a blessing to all nations because Jesus is coming through one of those sons. And if you remember, Jacob went down to Egypt, though against his will, certainly. And God used him to deliver and to save this whole nation. So there they are in Egypt. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Did I say Jacob? Joseph went down to Egypt to save them during the famine. You can correct me if I'm wrong. It's okay. I'm, I'm over myself. You can get over me too and correct me. The descendants of Jacob numbered 70 in all. Joseph was already in Egypt. There's the note. Got it? Got it. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died. But the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly. Part of the Abrahamic covenant, right? There it is. Increasing in numbers 
and became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Why do some people see a blessing as a problem? Here it comes. Then a new king, to whom Joseph meant nothing, that's a really key detail, came to power in Egypt. Look, he said to his people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, we must deal shrewdly with them, or they will become even more numerous. And if war breaks out, they'll join our enemies, fight against us, and then leave the country. You see the fear. So they put slave masters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built Pithom and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. Dread, another word for fear, of course. And worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor in brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. In all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, whose names were Shipra and Puol, when you were helping the Hebrew women during childbirth on the delivery stool, if you see that the baby is a boy, kill him. But if it's a girl, let her live. Isn't it remarkable what fear drives us to do? The midwives, however, feared God and did not do what the king of Egypt had told them to do, but let the boys live. Then the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and asked them, why have you done this? Why have you let the boys live? The midwives answered Pharaoh, Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women. They're vigorous and give birth before the midwives arrive. So God was kind to the midwives and the people increased and became even more numerous, which is another intentional reference to the promise given to Abraham. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families of their own, a legacy. Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Every Hebrew boy that is born, you must throw into the Nile, but every girl will live. And of course, what's that's a setup for? We know what's gonna happen with Moses, right? May God bless the reading of his scripture, and may we take to heart his command to us, fear not. Amen? Please be seated. What really impresses me about the book of Exodus and rereading it over and over is just this simple reminder that God has a bigger plan. I get so stuck in the details of things that I think are important, that I think are deserving of my fear and my restlessness. But God has a bigger plan. If the Exodus experience is something like a corn maze where you can wander through there for hours lost, God has the aerial picture above it and knows the exit strategy. Of course, exodus means exit or deliverance. And this is all about God's salvation. It's all about God's deliverance. So one, it, it's encouraging to me because it reminds us that God has a bigger picture. The other thing that I see specifically in this passage and that we'll see in Exodus everywhere is that God doesn't just wait for that one day of rescue. He is active and present today. Even in the midst of the bondage of the Hebrew people, even in the midst of the desert wandering that they're going to get to in some chapters here, we'll notice that God is intervening actively in human history. It's, it's one thing for God to speak a message of promise to Abraham. It's another thing for God to then show him favor and to be able to have a child when they were barren. It's another thing for God to work so miraculously in Joseph's life. We skipped over a lot of stuff from last Sunday to this Sunday, didn't we? As we go through all those chapters of Genesis. But why is the whole story of Joseph there? It's because it's God's way of intervening in human history to continue this promise that he gave way back to Abraham that I'm going to bring a savior to this world and nothing is going to stop me. 
There isn't a famine that's going to wipe them out. And there isn't a Pharaoh who has the power to wipe them out either. I love that God has a bigger picture, but that God is involved in their lives now. He's already at work. And these notes are everywhere in the book of Exodus. That God showed favor to the midwives. That God blessed them for their obedience. That God was at work in all of these things. God blessed his people and they multiplied even under oppression. In fact, the more they were oppressed, the more God's blessing was made evident. Now, of course, that's going to come as a threat to those in power. You know, Romans chapter 15 tells us why it's important for us to take time to study the Old Testament. Did you know that? The Apostle Paul says that all these things that were written before are written as examples to us for our encouragement and for our endurance. That's why it's so important that we never forget what God has done in breaking into human history and bringing the Savior Jesus. And so, very appropriately, we read the Old Testament through the lens of Jesus. We know what God is up to. We can see it, but in their shoes, they can't see it. And, and I think that that is a great encouragement to us. It gives us endurance. It gives us an example to follow. What you're gonna find in the pages of the Old Testament are both positive examples and negative examples. It's not all roses, is it? When it comes to the fear aspect of this passage, and I think you'll find, at least I do, that in chapter one, fear is the unifying chapter of everything that's going on. You've got the Egyptians that are fearful of the multiplying threat of the Hebrew people. They think that there are too many, that's too powerful. When an enemy comes, they're gonna join forces with them and defeat us and get out of here. So they're afraid. And then that's contrasted in this first chapter beautifully with not the fear of the Egyptians. They defy what the Egyptians tell them to do. They're not afraid. This defiant fear of the Egyptians. And instead, it's, it's a fear of God. And it's described that way as a fear of God. So I want to look at this message in those two parts. I want to look at this chapter in those two parts. On the one hand, God says, fear not. There's an unhealthy fear for all of us. And that command, as I've said, is repeated over and over and over in Scripture. So I want to start there with the negative example of the Egyptians and what their fear leads to. And then I want to turn the page and look at the positive example for our encouragement and as an example and for our instruction today. The fear of the Lord, after all, is the beginning of knowledge. It's the beginning of wisdom for us to fear the Lord. So you have both of these things going on with this word fear in Scripture. Don't fear, fear. And I want to talk about that a little bit. Let's talk about the fear of the Egyptians and what that led to. Fear, if you think about it, is experiencing a disorientation. Does it feel to you like the world is spinning these days? It feels like a disorientation and it can cause us to forget our blessings. I think about, I I use this word blessing because I want you to remember that Joseph, when he first came down to Egypt, was a blessing to the Egyptians. Agreed? God showed favor to Joseph when he was thrown into a pit and then sold into slavery. God was working out an incredible plan to actually not only save the Hebrew people, but to save the Egyptians as well. So God gave him these visions of seven years of of famine, but seven years of plenty that would precede it. And in the years of plenty, they stored enough grain to be able to survive the famine. And then they were a blessing to all nations around them. So Joseph and the Hebrews were a blessing to the Egyptians. And I I think that that's a perspective that we forget about. Chapter one, therefore, of Exodus is absolutely appalling. Fear has a power over us to cause us to question our blessings, to get a skewed perspective on reality, and to forget God's providence. 
they literally here are slapping the hand that has fed them. And that happens with any amount of time between blessings, wouldn't you say? Just some interesting background on all of this. You know that the Hebrew people were in Egypt a total of 430 years. We read that from Genesis 15 last week. We know that as we go through Exodus, there's clear time markers and it's stipulated. There's 430 years where they're going to be in all, if you count Joseph's arrival, into um, Egypt. So when you ask most people, how long were God's people enslaved? They'll say 400 years. But actually, that's not correct. It was certainly far fewer than 400 years. Why? Well, Joseph lived to 110 years old. And then we read in Exodus that his brother Levi lived to 137. And so there's a marker in Exodus that helps us understand. And this, this, what this chapter says is that there came into power a Pharaoh who didn't remember Joseph and who didn't remember his uh, Jacob's sons. Forgotten all about those blessings And that's when they began to see as a threat the multiplying of the Hebrew people. I was privileged, Teresa and I, in 2017 to travel to Egypt. And Egypt is properly considered part of a Holy Lands tour. They give biblical tours of Egypt. Egypt's mentioned 519 times in the Bible. And Egyptians, like my friend Midu, who was our guide, and the Lord willing, if we have a trip in 2022, Uh, he will be our guide again. He's eager to point out that actually Egypt is a blessing to God's people. He's a Coptic Christian himself. He's an Egyptologist. He's a fascinating guy. But in his math, and he has lots of reasons for it, lots of scripture by it, and and he toured us through the National Museum in Cairo, pointing out um, this particular pharaoh, Amen Hotep II, was in power at 1446 BC. He's probably the one that defied Moses. And of all things, Amen Hotep II's mummy is in their mummy cases. And, and I went in there and I looked, and this guy's tiny. <laughs> <He's>, <laughs> I mean, I'm sure mummified, they must not be as big. But, and I'm just thinking, the things that this guy or some other guy from his era saw and went through the 10 plagues and everything else and the stubbornness. Well, anyway, he wants to point out that Egypt was a blessing. Egypt actually preserves God's people over the generations and over the years. Um, He mentions that Abraham went down to Egypt. When? When there was a famine. He, of course, did his little sister act and lied about Sarah and all those good things. Nonetheless, God still spared them. He mentioned that Jesus was taken by Mary and Joseph when? When there was an infanticide. Does that sound familiar? When there was a a despotic ruler who was insane trying to kill all the Hebrew boys. Why? Because he was threatened by their power. Does that sound familiar? And I mentioned this last week that the Exodus becomes a really important paradigm or understanding of God's overall strategy And the New Testament writers understand this from their own perspective. Look what God did again. It's amazing. There's hope in the bigger picture. Okay, well, slaves for some time, but not all the time. The truth is, God's people were a blessing to the Hebrews as they were intended to be a blessing to all nations. That was the promise. But fear has a way of disorienting us from reality. Now, as you think about whatever fear you may have written down or are still thinking about, and, I, and I'll tell you a big fear for me, that, that, that one that I've just struggled with over the years, I think God has really helped me with this fear over time, is I have a fear of being put in a position where I might look foolish or out of control. And, and I think that that's something that I developed living in the situation that I lived in in my home, that I had to be in control and, you know, don't, don't look at the chaos that's going on in my family's life. Look at me because, you know, I can achieve. And my, my fear is that I could be put in a situation 
where I'm out of control or would look bad. I gotta tell you, the pandemic lockdown problems that it creates for church leadership, it's like my nightmare. <laughs> so we have no control anymore, as if we ever did. <laughs> and in that way, it's not all bad. You know, a bondage experience, an exodus experience can teach us things that we will not learn when we're dipping our feet in the banks of the Jordan. <laughs> there are things that, that God will teach us and ways that God will provide in the middle of the chaos if we're open to find it. And the positive example we'll get to is, is I love that they still feared God in the middle of all the chaos. But beware, whatever your fear is, it can be disorienting to you to the extent that you lose track of the fact that God is in fact at work right now in the bigger picture and in your life. Church is not on hold, still, still alive, still going. Do you believe it? Isn't every part of church history a waiting period? We're waiting for Jesus' return. We're not waiting for the end of a pandemic. And there's an urgency about who we are and what we're called to be and what we're called to do in this desert and, and in this place south of where God wants his people eventually to be. No matter how long it takes to wander through the corn maze or the desert. No matter, no matter. God still has a plan from the beginning to the end. And do you believe it that what we do, whether we are fearing God or whether we're fearing circumstance or people, whether we're caving to our fear, do you believe that that matters? The way Exodus reads, a savior is going to come to rescue them, Moses, because of the faithfulness of people like this. And I, we don't have a bigger story. We're just risking our lives, hanging out by the Nile River. <laughs> we, we don't know, but God does. And I know that he says to us, fear not. We can be disoriented to forget our blessings. Would, would you just tell somebody next to you, God is at work in your life today. God is at work in your life today. Do you believe it? And he's at work in his church. Not, not just Meridian friends, but globally. God's doing something. The battle belongs to him. And we're called to keep our eyes on him. Don't let fear, circumstance, that you might look foolish, disorient you from the fact that God is active today and he is working. A second thing fear does to us and did to the Egyptians here. Fear is not knowing what's going to happen. Amen? <laughs> so, I mean, fear's a disorientation. Something happens that shifts and, and we have to figure out what to do with it. It's disorienting. We thought we were oriented whether we ever were or not. And we're disoriented. And now we know that we don't know what's going to happen. That's the difference actually. But fear is not knowing what's going to happen, which can cause us to grasp for control, to try to find control over situations that we have no control over. And so, of course, for the Egyptians, they resort to violence. They oppress the Hebrew people out of their fear. They oppress them and they try to control them. People who were a blessing to them, who were continuing to be a blessing to them. But because of their fear, they mess it all up. And do you know that Exodus is not going to be kind to the Egyptians? Am I right? This is not going to go well for them. Fear often spoils when we try to take control for ourselves what only God can do. And when we try to do that, we often really mess things up. And God has blessed Egypt up to this point with what he's done for them. But when we don't know what's going to happen, 
all of us have this tendency to think, I need to control this. I need to step in and, and help God. Teresa and I were talking about fear the other day, just knowing that this is the topic, and I was telling her about what I'm seeing in this chapter as a theme. And we had this conversation that went like this. How many sins can you identify that have fear as their root? And I was thinking about this. I mean, fear does all kinds of horrible things. And I just jotted a few of them down. It certainly leads to lying. You remember Abraham did go down to Egypt and he lied about his sister. Why? Because he's afraid. Lying, and that really wasn't good for him. You know what I'm talking about? That, that is not a husband of the year thing to do. Okay, if you know the story. It leads to cheating. It, it leads to hoarding, if you're afraid. Our blessings, we hoard them. It, it leads to avoidance. Denial is not just a river in Egypt anymore. Leads to busyness. You can't hear the roaring laughter inside the sanctuary online, sorry. It leads to busyness. Do you believe it? I mean, we, we can't... We can't possibly take time for the real priorities in life, like conversations with people and family and Sabbath rest and worship, small groups and Bible study. We can't because we're too busy. We're, we're afraid that we won't get everything done. Who can do all that? And on and on and on. And again, just outright violence. Pharaoh threatens people, um, kills babies. I mean, the whole thing is just horrific. And it's fear-driven. So you might think about that. What am I afraid of when you think about a sin that you're trying to control in your own life? A third element of fear that I see in this chapter, fear is realizing that there is far more to our circumstances than we know. And see, the difference is now we know what we didn't know. There's always been far more to our circumstances than we knew. And therefore, we flee or fight our threat. I'm not saying that information is bad. I'm not saying that fear is not a natural instinct of self-protection that is an important thing for us. If, I mean, driving defensively, for example, is a really good idea. I, and, and I drive defensively out of fear. Let me just tell you, our traffic is changing in this valley. <laughs> I hear amens <laughs> on that one. And I just don't trust what the next car is going to do. And right here on Cherry Lane on my way home from the church Thursday, there was a four-car pileup on Cherry Lane. <laughs> Somebody wasn't paying attention, and at least three people were going too fast. And where was I going with that? Fear is not all bad if it drives us to be responsible, Right? I'm about to get to the positive parts of fear. It's, it's something, it's a God-given tool for our protection. But fear can easily become an idol. It can be something that we look to instead of looking to God for direction. I'm drawn to preach on Exodus because for me, it's the biblical picture in my mind of what's happening globally with the pandemic. And I realized that a while back. Wow, you know, I, I can relate to those people wandering in the desert right now. And I can relate to all the dead ends and do-overs and learning lessons over and over. And yet, God's still providing daily in the middle of it. So to me, that, that's what draws me to bring you to the book of Exodus in this, in this season right now. And I'm so thankful for God's bigger view. Has fear caused you to flee something that would be obedience for you? Has fear caused you to fight something that is not yours to fight? Fear is a dangerous, dangerous thing. And I think we have lots of warning right here in Exodus as to what it can do. Literally an attempt at a genocide. The fear of God, on the other hand, and of course, that's the contrast that you have in this chapter. The fear of circumstances, the fear of fear itself, the fear even of our blessings and misunderstanding them. Contrasted with the fear of God, the scripture says, however, the Hebrew midwives 
did not fear Pharaoh. They feared God. And they ignored what Pharaoh told them to do because they knew what the right thing was to do. They were faithful. Well, get this. The fear of God, it's everywhere in the scripture also, right? I cited from Proverbs 1, fear of God's beginning wisdom. What is it? Well, the fear of God is also experiencing a disorientation. Let me explain that. The fear of God is beginning to realize that you do not understand everything there is to understand about an omnipotent, eternal God who has control of everything. And there are things you do not know. And I have to tell you, that's a disorientation from a carnal way of thinking about life, from a natural way of thinking that we're it in the universe. You know, we control everything and whatever. We don't. And when we really come to, to grips with who God is, when we come to grips with the fact that he's eternal, we begin to try to think about that, that he has a bigger perspective, it becomes threatening in a way. Because, well, what if we're part of the generation that gets to be enslaved for 400 years? What if? What if we're part of the generation that gets to die in the desert after taking all these laps? What if? You begin to realize that God has this 40,000 foot corn maze and then you get to decide what to do with that. You get to decide what you're going to do, but a proper fear of God doesn't then try to steal control. A proper fear of God doesn't question our blessings. A proper fear of God doesn't flee or, or doesn't fight God. That disorientation instead leads to a reverence. It leads to a sense of wonder. And I think as a church, we shouldn't get over that. We do not control what God is doing here. We don't. Ultimately, he has control in ways that we will not understand. Even if you're chosen among a whole generation of people like Moses, his life was very hard. He suffered. In fact, as a leader, I think he double suffered. Did you see how the people treated him? And to suddenly realize that it's not all up to you, but we worship a God who's in control and we're not, is a disorientation. And it's a freedom. I mean, to me, I can shrug my shoulders on this one. I can let go of the things that, that I think are my responsibility and, and the sense of self-shame and, and the anger and the hurt that I want to impose upon myself or, up, or upon others if I think it's their fault. And I can instead be disoriented in the fact that God is bigger than me. And it's not up to my self-reliance. And, and a fear of God knows that. A fear of God takes off their sandals in front of a bush and says, if you want me to leave this life that I have that's so comfortable and you want me to, to wander back over to Egypt where I'm a wanted man where they're going to kill me, then I'll do it. <laughs> it happens many times in the book of Exodus. A fear of God. Here's, here's what also a fear of God is. A fear of God is realizing that you don't know what's going to happen that you don't have a plane ride above the cornfield. Well, unless you happen to be uh, somebody like Ezekiel and God takes him up there and says, here's what it really looks like, oh, don't. For the rest of us, we're just staring at dead corn stalks. We're looking at the stinky sandals in front of the person who's, who's trudging in front of us and grumbling. We're hungry. We're thirsty, we're tired. And we don't know what's going to happen. We so want to control it, but we can't. But a fear of God knows that in such a way that it inspires rather than defeats. It inspires a sense of a daring obedience. 
if I don't have control anyway, if I don't know anyway, then I need to look to somebody who does. And I need to do everything that he says for me to do. And in my generation, I want to be part of a church that is faithful. I want to be part of a, yeah, a group gathering in the desert. If that's God's will and that's God's plan for us, then bless God's name. But let me be faithful in it. It's not what I wanted. It's not what I pictured. But Jesus, let us be faithful and let your bigger plan be made known in us. Help us to draw others who are struggling and fearful without a fear of God. Without a willingness to be daringly obedient to defy Pharaoh. God, give us a reverent wonder for who you are. Give us an obedience to follow you when we're so afraid. We had these great plans to do a vision day in 2020. <laughs> we had more great plans to do a vision day in 2021. I was visiting with Lori Reinhardt with my discouragement about this recently. And she reminded me that God is completely in control on this one, Ken. I mean, look at the timing of people within our own congregation that were ill, myself included. And there's no other way. I mean, we put this on the calendar thinking that was the best possible date that we could be safe to do. It was our wisdom. But we didn't know it was going to happen. And I'm just assured that, that God's in control. Well, somebody sent me this article about um, what a certain church looked like in the year 2003. And it was when we were doing this big ramp up for this vision day. Of, God, where are you going to lead us next? Where are you going to lead us next? Uh, and it was by Tom Rayner. And Tom Rayner, if you recognize that name, was the speaker at our yearly meeting sessions, which were all online this past year. He did a wonderful job. And I'm just going to read it for you because as we go through Exodus and today, I not only want us to think about this as, well, what do I fear personally? But what does the church fear corporately? Or what's obedience for me personally? I want us to think about this as what is obedience for us corporately as a body? Because really, that's what Exodus is, don't you think? It's far less about the superstars. It, it's really about God leading the whole group like a flock. And so let me just read this. This is kind of glum, just be ready. But I think it's, I think it's an important picture of fear. Tom Rayner wrote this. I was, at their, I was a church consultant for such and such a body in 2003. The church's peak attendance was 750 people in 1975. By the time I got there, attendance had fallen to an average of 83. The large sanctuary seemed to swallow the relatively small crowd on Sunday morning. I'm offering this because I don't know if you know this, but as many as 100,000 churches in America are dying right now. This is pre-COVID. It's even more accelerated at this point. You know this? I don't think it's just for me to give you a happy picture of the church today because it isn't. I really feel like we were already in a wilderness as a church. Not, not really in Friends Church particularly. The church. I've seen so many Friends Churches, by the way, close their doors. So many Friends Churches that are struggling. He writes, the reality was that most of the members did not want me there. He was a consultant. Uh, they were not about to pay a consultant to tell them what was wrong with their church. Only when a benevolent member offered to foot my entire bill did the congregation grudgingly agree to retain me. I worked with the church for three weeks. The problems were obvious. The solutions were difficult. On my last day, the benefactor walked to me, mocked me to my rental car. Well, what do you think, Tom? He asked. He could see the uncertainty in my expression, so he clarified, how long can our church survive? So many churches are just asking that question. That is the wrong question. I paused for a moment and then offered the bad news. That's a fearful question, by the way. How long can our church survive? Not, 
Lord, what do you want for us to do? That's boldly uh, daring obedience. And he said, I believe the church will close its doors in five years. I was wrong, he writes. The church closed just a few weeks ago, which was 2003, so just a few years later. Like many dying churches, it held on to life tenaciously. This church lasted 10 years. There it was, 10 years after my terminal diagnosis. Oh, it went further. There it is. My friend from the church called me to tell me the news. I took no pleasure in discovering that not only was my diagnosis correct, I had mostly gotten right all the signs of the impending death of the church. Together, my friend and I reviewed the past 10 years. I think we were able to piece together a fairly accurate, and he called this the autopsy of a dead church. The church refused to look like the community was number one. They didn't want to transition toward lower, lower socioeconomic class people, which their neighborhood had become. The church had no community focused ministries. This part of the autopsy may seem to be stating the obvious, but I want to be certain my friend affirmed my suspicions there was no attempt to reach the community. The percentage of the budget for members needs kept increasing. In fact, it was 98%. There were no evangelistic emphases. When a church loses its passion to reach the lost, the congregation begins to die. Remember, God blesses daring obedience. Pharaoh cannot stop them. It goes against our human logic. Here's number six he lists. The members had more and more arguments about what they wanted. Arguments were more frequent. Business meetings became more acrimonious. Seven, with few exceptions, pastoral tenure grew shorter and shorter. Eight, the church rarely prayed together in the last eight years. The only time of corporate prayer was a three-minute period on the Sunday morning worship service. Nine, the church had no clarity as to why it existed. There was no vision no mission and no purpose. Uh, 10, the members idolized another era. This is going to be one that we will find in Exodus, right? I mean, this is really an Exodus. All of the active members were over the age of 67, the last six years of the church, and they remembered fondly um, uh, back to the 1970s in their case. And, and on it goes. Now, I know that that's not really rosy and cheerful and, and, and everything else, but I really think that a huge part, if it were up to me to diagnose what I'm seeing around uh, what I'm familiar with in churches, it's fear. And I can't tell you how many churches I know of that, that are struggling, who are asking this very question, how can we survive? Do you know that's what Pharaoh was asking? It was self-preservation that led him to the annihilation, the attempted annihilation of the Hebrew people. That's what he was doing. Self-preservation is not the gospel. Would you agree? Okay, there's a soapbox. I'll step down. But the fear of God is different. Yes, it's disorientation. Yes, it's not knowing what's going to happen but it's responding in a completely different way than the way our flesh wants to respond. Third, it's realizing that there is far more to our circumstances. Does this sound familiar? That's what fear is. It's, it's realizing that there's far more to our circumstances than we know. There already was far more to our circumstances than we knew. But now we know that. And therefore, we wait with God. We wait for God to act with a radical awe and amazement. Fear isn't that we think God's going to punish us. That's not the fear of God. We know our standing in Christ. The fear of God is a reverent wonder before him. The fear of God is a daring obedience. The fear of God is an awe and it's an amazement of what he is about to do. I want to be like the midwives. I want my eyes fixed on the God who's at work today, who I know is going to win this battle. I want to be willing. And I've intentionally confessed my fear to you because that puts me in a place where I could very easily fail. But 
I want to be obedient more than I'm worried about failure. I want to invite us to spend a few moments in reflection, in listening to the Lord's voice in open worship. And I thought a good way to transition us into that is this focus from Psalm 23. And then let's take time to listen. If you are prompted to speak, that there's something that God has given for all of us to hear, our comments will not be online. If you're online, we invite you to use this time of silence to pray. And if God speaks to you for the group and you're online, then please put it in the comments and we would really benefit from hearing what is on your heart. For those of us that are here in the fellowship hall or in the sanctuary, you can come to this microphone to speak. The Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures, doesn't he? He leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. And even in obedience to following him, look where we end up. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Oh, I, just, I just prefer he prepares a table for me and him and the people I like. That's not how God works. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies in the middle of my problems, in the middle of my fears, in the middle of my hurts, in the middle of my frustrations. He's present. In fact, it's more than that. You anoint my head with oil and my cup overflows. God, thank you for your blessings right now. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.